I don't really know how to do the sort of prep stuff without it being somewhat intensive because otherwise I just don't feel I have the confidence. I always imagine that I'm going to get to set and the director's going to go, I don't even like this scene, make it up. And I've got to be ready for that. And if I'm not ready for that, I feel very insecure arriving on the set. American Psycho. New card. What do you think? Whoa. Very nice. Look at that. Picked them up from the printers yesterday. Good call, Ren. That's bone. Any scene we were doing every single day, I had the book by my side and I would read through it every single time because Brett had just had so many wonderful descriptions. And I think that was why Mary and I clicked was because when I first went and auditioned for her, I just went to her apartment and it was just her with a little camera. And I, I didn't approach it like she said the other actors had where they were talking about what's his childhood, what's the reason he's become this. I was like, ah, none of that really matters. He's just like this alien. And so as we were doing the scene, I started laughing and she started cracking up and we both realized we had the same very sick sense of humor and we were like, oh yeah, all right, this will work between us. She really put herself on the line, you know, and I, I so appreciate that because she had so many known actors who, who were stepping up and wanted to do it. And she just said, no, I want Christian, even though all the financiers were saying, we're going to give you no money. And then actually kicked the two of us off. Uh, you know, we went and we did a stage reading in New York for it. Uh, Willem Dafoe was there. Chloe Sevigny was there. And uh, Brace and Ellis was there. And then we got the money. Yay. But what our agents forgot to do, our agents at the time, uh, forgot to do was to include us in the package. And so we raised the money and then they said, right, and the two of you, bye-bye. But um, I, I went a little bit psycho myself in that, in that I just said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm still making the film. And even though other people were cast, other directors were on board, I just kept on prepping. And I would call Mary up and she would say, Christian, they've given it to other people. And I was like, yeah, 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 no, it doesn't matter. We're still going to make it. And she was like, ooh, he's lost the plot. And all my friends were saying that to me, like, what are you doing? And I was turning down... It wasn't like I was getting offered much, but, you know, a couple of projects, not really good ones, I turned them down and kept on going. And lo and behold, look at that, it did eventually come back. So that felt like a great victory. Don't doubt your gut instincts, you know, always listen, always be aware of the style that the director's looking for. But understand, you're always going to bring something unique from anybody else. When there still was the Wall Street uh, trading floors and everything, I went and visited, you know, all different levels of people at Wall Street. But the guys on the trading floor, when I arrived there before making the film, I got there and a bunch of them, they were going, oh, Patrick Bateman, and patting me on the back and going, oh, yeah, we love him. And I was like, yeah, ironically, right? And they were like, what do you mean? So it was always worrying, um, even back then. But, you know, clearly, look, it's a satire on capitalism in the 80s and as such is 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 so bloody far-fetched and ridiculous that you know to me i can't help but think it's hilarious do you like phil collins i've been a big genesis fan ever since the release of their 1980 album duke i'm not going to ruin anyone's enjoyment and say that i'm not a huge fan and that they're not life-changing songs of course they are, for everyone, right? Come on, when you admit it. For me, uh, it's, uh, music's so much a part of actually building characters as well. You know, like for Amsterdam, uh, David and I were listening to and, and watching a lot of jazz documentaries, etc. and I use all sorts of different uh, uh, music to help me, you know, get into the mood when I'm working. Because emotion really comes through the ears, you know, something that you notice when you're in the edit room. You really see how you can see the visual Keep that the same, but change the music, and it absolutely changes the way you feel about it. So it, it's such a you know joy of life. Get a goddamn job, Al. You got a negative attitude. That's what's stopping you. I remember somebody threatening me on the street because some people did object to the film getting made and all that. And I remember people saying that they were going to do me harm and stuff like that. You know, and I would actually go like, I remember somebody, somebody warned me. It must have been a friend of mine who was crazy early on the internet, and they warned me. They called me up and they went, "There's some person, and they know where you walk every single day, and you go down this back alley, and they say that they're going to jump on you and they're going to rip your cerebral cortex out of your head. So please don't go down that alley." So of course I was like, "I'm going to that alley." I want to see what happens. And unfortunately, nothing. I kept walking up and down it going, where are they? Come on. What's... <laughs> but nothing ever happened. Batman. I'm Batman. Yeah, what a 
weirdo, right? Jumping around town at night in a bat outfit. In many ways, in the same way that people were telling me, hey, you can't go play Patrick Bateman, it's career suicide. And I was like, bring it on. I definitely want to do that. Other people also said, hey, you know, if you play Batman, that's it. You're never going to play anything else again. You will always be Batman. And I went, bring it on. Let's see if that happens. Because I just always felt like, look, if, if I don't have the skill to be able to rise above that, then I don't deserve to either. I absolutely know and cherish the fact that that will be the role I'm probably remembered for most, you know, every is an iconic, you know, larger than life um, uh, role. But I don't view it really as, oh, being stopped in the street. For me, it was, ah, I could pay off my house. That's a huge relief, you know. That was a dream of mine since being a kid. So I really appreciate that. I thank Chris Nolan no end for that. You know, the experience of actually working with him, of course, and we went on to make, you know, four films together. But the fact that that allowed me to make so many other films, you know, for instance, it took Mary a Herculean effort, which I so appreciate, to get me cast in American Psycho post-Batman. It got a little bit easier for directors to suggest me and financiers to say, OK, yeah, we'll take him. You've got the wounded child who never moved on from the atrocity and tragedy that happens to him and he loses his parents. And then the kind of monster uh, that represents, you know, all of his anger and that he, you know, concentrates, focuses into this character of uh, 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 the Batman. And then the kind of charade, which is the, the, the playboy, apparently vacant and that no one would ever suspect of having any beliefs or causes ever in his life. Most of my recollection of making Batman is sitting doing crosswords by myself in a blue tent with very uncomfortable stuff on because they wanted me ready in 15 minutes at any given go. So I was always sitting there and these things going, uh, four down. Hello, is anyone out there? Heath Ledger, who, oh my God, you know, what a performance, what a pleasure to have uh, gotten to work with him and just to see him, you know, and how much he put himself into the Joker. And I, and, I, and I was watching it going, yeah, this is absolutely fantastic. Are we in trouble here? Of when Chris and I first sat down, we said, you know what the problem with Batman is, is that the villains are always more interesting. Right. And so Batman actually, he's very close to being a villain himself. So let's never let him become dull by comparison. And unfortunately, I was sitting there going, I'm feeling a little bit dull by comparison because Heath is just like killing this. And uh, but I'm so proud of that film. I love it. it the, the, the Dark Knight is absolutely extraordinary, you know, and it was such a pleasure to have gone to work with Heath. I don't, I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? Go back to ripping off mob dealers? No, no, no. No, you, you complete me. You're garbage. You kills for money. Don't talk like one of them. You're not. Even if you'd like to be. He, he was a wonderful um, uh, go-kart uh, driver, a uh, racer. Yeah, we went, we went and raced the uh, go-karts and holy crap, he beat all, all the stunt guys and everything. He was quick. So when we went to the track, we thought, of course, the stunt guys are going to win. And then suddenly Heath wins gets top place and then very quietly mentions, yeah, my dad was a go-kart racer. Very talented individual and a great soul to be around. Yeah, I miss him greatly. The Fighter. <laughs> Dicky, he's such a character, like he makes his presence felt all the time. I mean, I spent so much time hanging out with Dicky beforehand and still in touch and still in touch with Dicky Jr. Being in Lowell, hanging out with him, going walking around, getting kicked out of bars, having almost every cop stopping and going, hey, hey, Dickie, and then telling me about a story about when they arrested him. Going to the boxing gym, jumping in the ring and sparring with him. And oh my God, it's really quite something when you, you might think you can, ah, oh, I'll be a decent boxer. You spar with other amateurs and whatnot. I've done that a few times, but when you get in the ring with a pro, ooh, bloody hell. I remember one time he was sitting and he was reading the script and I was busy doing something else and suddenly I see him like stand up and he starts walking over to David like oh. and I could see you know something had happened and I went weed this ain't good and jumped over and said Dicky, 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 what and just kind of talked him down because it was about sort of you know hey look when you tell someone's story you got to tell the good stuff and you got to tell the bad stuff otherwise there ain't no story there at all it was the first film that I've made with David and so getting to understand this process more and then and then he's kind of enhanced that as we've made more films together and i loved it i loved playing uh, uh dicky so much there were hilarious things and there was you know stuff to do with just sort of almost being shut down by the local cops and things like that but to me that's all part of the fun of it the machinist
You okay? Don't I look okay? Brad, when I turned up, was really stunned at how much weight I'd lost. He went, oh, you really did it. Like, he didn't think I really was going to. That was just a, 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 a outward show of his guilt and being eaten alive, literally, you know, by guilt. I'd come off of making a couple of films that I'd been less than satisfied with and just really wanted something where I could become immersed and obsessed with it. You know, I mean, I remember at the time it was like not the smart thing to do because there was no money in it. And it was like, oh, bloody hell, I'm going to lose my uh, place where I'm living. And I was quite newly married and all that. So it wasn't the business smart thing to do, but I've never been smart in a business way. But it was something that I really wanted to challenge myself and kind of see, could I achieve that? Could I fulfill how I imagined that the part of Trevor should be played, um, you know, and, t and testing myself? Hey, perfect fit. <sighs> A lot of times, actually, I would sit there with headphones in, but I wasn't listening to anything. I was just pretending to listen so that I could actually hear everything that was going on, but nobody thought I could. Also, at the time, I was engaged in a very filthy habit of smoking, so I was rolling my own cigarettes and sitting there puffing away. I did read numerous things. I remember uh, because of the conversation with Brad, the director, I, was, I read Crime and Punishment, but then I was reading a lot of Light Affair as well. The main point was that somehow losing all the physical weight put all the energy into my brain and so i only slept two hours a night and all i wanted to do was read and so i would just sit and read endlessly and i found that i could read um, without stopping and needing to move or get a distraction i could i could just sit and read for 10 hours straight without moving a muscle yeah i can't do that now the big short i've been very clear people will withdraw their money. Orange, that would be so stupid. I mean, the, the, if, 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 if the fund's capitals drop too much, then the swap's contracts are voided, and then the banks uh, get to keep all of the collateral. Wait a minute, wait. All of it. What? The contracts are voided? The contracts are voided? I had a wonderful day where we sat in his darkened office together and just chatted and uh, they had scheduled all these things for us to go out and about and do different stuff and we ended up doing none of that because we just enjoyed talking with each other so much and had just an extraordinary day and he was so helpful and then he came to visit the set and then uh, you know we, we keep in touch from time to time and he's uh, an extraordinarily special guy and what, wow what a role and also my first time working with Adam which I just loved you know, he's, he's something else, you know, it's uh, like with David, you know, when you get really great directors, they're very unique uh, uh, in, in the way that they work. Anyone who plays drums can look and go, Christian doesn't play drums. But that to me was not the point. The point was not that Michael Burry was a shit hot drummer. It was that he took his anger out on these drums. And I did, I was just shattering the drumsticks. They were flying across the crew, had to all put shields up because so many of them were flying at speed, <laughs> everybody. I love to get to interview people. I love to get to really study them in an obsessive way that you wouldn't get to usually. That's part of the joy of, of the job for me. Vice. I sense that uh... You're a kinetic leader. You make decisions based on instinct. I am. Mm. People always said that. Yeah, yeah. Very different. Very different from uh, from your father in that regard. All right, let's dig a bit deeper and go do the very unlikely thing of me play Dick Cheney, which I was like, what? Adam, are you him high? Usually they don't allow special effects makeup artists that much time to prep, but I said, no way, we've got to have, you know, months and months and months to, to get anywhere close to something that can work here because it's, it's the movement, you know? Thank God, you know, we had people who were uh, patient enough with me to just kind of keep going and keep going and keep going until eventually going, all right, I think, I think we're in the realm. A wonderful experience working, you know, with Adam. He uses a mic and will kind of just chuck out lines and chuck out ideas and try saying this instead. Not improvising, but like, you know, suggesting lines and nudging you in the right direction, but you've got to be prepared to pivot and be on your toes. Um, even though Cheney's very not somebody who you would think of as being on his toes, he's very much like flat-footed. But yeah, no, really enjoyed uh, the immersion that that took, you know, even though it was like the four hours in the 
chair and whatnot. I had never believed that it, it could be possible that I could play him, and to, to, to give it a shot is uh, just a, it was a wonderful risk. You have authorization to shoot down any aircraft deemed a threat. Presidential authority? That is correct. All orders are unidir. Unidir, sir? Unless otherwise directed. Mr. Vice President, are we sure these are the proper rules of engagement? The country is under attack. The ROE is fluid. Well, he was very brilliant, you know. He is. He, he is a brilliant man, you know. He, he, whether you agree with what he, his intent, you know, was and is, there's absolute brilliance and intelligence there, you know. He rose incredibly quickly for good reason. He, he understood the machinery of, um, of politics uh, better than anyone else did, and so he could manipulate that. And for someone who was absolutely awful at, like, retail politics, you know, he had no interest in kissing babies or whatever, he was very interested in the true mechanics of power and, and how that works, and he's, uh, there's nobody better at it uh, than him. Empire of the Sun. Man, what an adventure. Yeah, it was something else. I got to not go to school and travel about by myself. And I had no idea just how unique that experience was at the time, because I didn't realize that every film didn't build a bloody runway that planes could land on in the middle of a marshland in Spain, or build a pagoda, or build, you know, huge hospitals, or build literally half a full-size stadium out there. I didn't realize every film didn't travel to China and have, you know, 10,000 extras up and down the Bund. You know, it wasn't until later when I was on much smaller films, I went, oh, yeah, no, that was a big one. <laughs> Which I think was great in that way because I didn't really feel any pressure. And at that age, I didn't really feel like uh, an actual film was going to come out of it at the end. I was just in the moment doing it. Uh, animals and children are the best actors. You can't compete with them. And the reason is because they don't give a shit about the consequences. And in many ways, that was how I felt when I was making Empire of the Sun. You know, not through any intentional thing, it just didn't even enter my mind. B-29s? Yeah, the super fortress, what we call a hemisphere defense weapon. Where from? Okinawa, Philippines. Tokyo is in bombing range now. Tokyo? You're time to think of going home soon. There's a great purity to just playing a role, and that's it, because every kid does it. Every, every kid, I still consider that I, I play dress up. Uh, for a living, you know? And kids do that naturally. It only gets spoiled when adults come in and ruin it um, by bringing money and expectations and you should do more, etc. That's when things go wrong. I never felt that while I was filming. You know, I mean, there were times because I left my family, etc. They they weren't able to come with me. So, I, you know, I'd be like in the airport, you know, crying my eyes out going, I don't want to go. But when I got there, Man, I was loving it, and I was enjoying it no end. But then it was, it was when I started doing the press, I didn't get that, I couldn't understand that. And I didn't understand why I had to keep talking about the same thing all day long. And I was you know, starting to go insane, and then people follow me around or whatever. And so that was when I went, oh, no, this isn't, this isn't for me. But I always focused on going, yeah, but I really did love doing it itself. So let's try to figure it out so I can deal with this part of it and not uh, have to stop doing the, the bit that I really do enjoy. There's a price for everything. And it's a, it's a, uh, once you get your head around it, it's a very small price to pay for getting to tell uh, stories. And I recognize and I'm so grateful for what I do get to, to do. Amsterdam. How can I know this is you really in the picture? Uh, yes, sir. So, well, I'm the doctor. She's the nurse. He's the attorney. We all met in Belgium, which, if you recall, is where we met for the first time. To Bert, someone who's in, in experimental medicine, and likewise so with his brace, you know, it's something that he hates, but he can't be without because he's got such terrible injuries, you know, to his back and his spine and everything like that. So, no, I just kept it on all the time because also you, you see it through the, the suit, you know? It's kind of like two little bumps of the metal sticking out, you know? And, and if I can avoid acting, I do avoid acting. Like if you can just really do it and be uncomfortable, why bother pretending to be uncomfortable? Just be uncomfortable.
It was a practical thing because, you know, these, these were very rudimentary back braces, not like anything you would get today. These were things that he had kind of made himself in the same way that he's working on creating medicine that can help these returning war vets who weren't given a damn bit of help. You know, they were meant to be returning heroes and absolutely nobody treated them like that. It was despicable. And who were all suffering from PTSD, but nobody recognized that um, at all and these terrible, terrible injuries, but didn't have uh, the right painkillers uh, or, or anxiety pills or whatever. David and I, we wanted to create um, characters that we loved, that we wanted to hang out with, characters that just refused to be beaten down by life, despite everything that life had thrown at them, that they remained optimistic, refused to be cynical whatsoever. Eyebrows up was kind of our mantra. Where is my eye, Harold? Right here. Yes. You leave me here with this invalid when you know very well that I think she should be hospitalized. It's for her own good. I, I do remember that both of them looked a bit shell-shocked on the very first day of work because they hadn't worked with David before. We'll film the script, but then he will just throw different lines at people or he'll just change the lines. No, don't you say that. You're going to say that now. And he'll be laying on the floor underneath here and then he'll crawl during the scene over there and then he'll be up behind the camera over here. And then he'll just say, change everything and go do that. And I love it, but uh, David would occasionally come to me when he saw someone was just sort of looking like a deer caught in headlights and say, oh, can you go be the ambassador and just explain how we're going to do this? And then everyone got into it. And, and then it's really joyful and, and, and just a very, very satisfying experience. And Margot and JD just embraced it. You know, and then I would go off and, you know, I'd telephone him and go, I sound like a stalker, but I'd be like, there's a dude I'm following down the street. Oh my God, he's fantastic. I'm going to use this for Bernie. He's like, great. And then I'd tell him that mannerisms from different people, attitudes, you know, it was all kind of very baked in and over years. So it, it, what's wonderful about that is that by the time you're actually filming, it's really in your bones. Pale Blue Eye. There's so many good actors. I, I tell you, lately I've been so blessed with the different amount of talented actors I've gotten to work with. And so it was a real pleasure to work with all them, but let me just focus on one, and that would be Harry Melling, because Harry is just a really superb actor. And so I, I just I just enjoyed any day that we got to do uh, scenes together. Scott Cooper and I have worked together now. This is our third film. I love working with Scott. And this was something that we've been talking about since like uh, 2012 that he had been putting together. He is prolific beyond belief in terms of his writing. He went and did different things. I went and did different things. But just the period of it, uh, the gothic uh, sort of crime um, uh, nature of it, the sort of uh, fun origin story um, of Edgar Allan Poe and what might have made him into such a master of the macabre and why he was so comfortable and enjoyed that way of thinking and trying to think about, okay, well, what, what, let's create a character that could have inspired all of that and that also keeps in the vein of an Edgar Allan Poe story itself as well. So, and I think Scott's done a superb job again uh, with that.